The Western world has always tried to impose on Africa its principles of natural resource management. Using the sensationalist Western media, cuddly cartoon characters and social media, public opinion is systematically manipulated. Preservationism, the idea that wildlife should roam free in some kind of idyllic Eden with no human influence, is presented as the only doctrine. This ideology has given rise to the indignant keyboard conservationist whose animal rights mantra rings out across cyberspace, crowding out any rational discourse. But should Africa be dictated to on how to manage its natural resources using punitive foreign laws? The continent does have its challenges. Wildlife and wilderness is under threat from many quarters, but there are practical ways of dealing with these issues. The Transfrontier Park concept, where adjoining national parks from two or more neighboring countries are combined to form a single conservation unit, is based on the principle that ecosystems should transcend national borders. The collaborative management of the single unit is key to its success. A transfrontier conservation area differs from a transfrontier park in that it comprises different component areas, such as the transfrontier park itself, private game reserves, communal areas, and safari hunting concessions. Free movement of animals between the different sectors may not always be possible because of man-made barriers such as fences, major highways, and railway lines. The overall objective is to establish large conservation areas by integrating vast landscapes and reconnecting ecological systems. The Great Limpopo Transfrontier Park aims to link various national parks in South Africa, Mozambique and Zimbabwe into an area of around 14,000 square miles in extent. The larger Great Limpopo Transfrontier Conservation Area will eventually cover an area of almost 39,000 square miles. With the Transfrontier Park at its core, it will include bordering communal areas and private game reserves and conservancies. In February 2017, the 600,000-acre Greater Labombo Conservancy was incorporated into the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Conservation Area. Within the Greater Labombo Conservancy lies the Sabi Game Park, extending over 75,000 acres. Before the independence and civil wars in Mozambique, which spanned 25 years, most of the properties bordering South Africa's Kruger National Park were cattle ranches. The larger animals, such as lion, elephant and leopard, were deemed pests and were eliminated by the ranchers. When war broke out in 1964, anarchy reigned as wildlife across the region was slaughtered to feed the forces on both sides. The unsustainable bushmeat trade thrived. Alex MacDonald is the conservation director of the Sabi Game Park. When we first came in 2001 to this general area, there really wasn't much. There was a fantastic scenery and all we really saw were a few dugger boys, some rabbits and some steenbuck and diker. Anything else was either killed because of being problem animals or for meat. Established in 2001, the initial aim of the Sabi Game Park was to create an upmarket ecotourism destination. This model, however, was not viable and in 2007, the current directors decided to convert the area into a safari hunting concession. Sandy McDonald is the CEO of Sabi Game Park. I'm just a, a very small part of a very successful team and we have managed to amass an incredible amount of experience on the ground through the management teams, through sourcing the right people. I am the reserve manager for Sabi Game Park. I run the whole of the ground operation on the reserve, including game counts, road maintenance, fence maintenance. I work very closely with the anti-poaching team. I'm in charge of putting together the hunting quotas on the game counts that we do. We do two game counts a year. I work with two sets of researchers that we have coming in here. And I also work very closely with a consulting ecologist that we have. The natural boundary between Mozambique and South Africa are the Labombo mountain ranges. And within the range is a well-established fence. We're right up on top of the Labombo mountains now. This is South Africa's 
eastern boundary. This is the fence between Mozambique and, and South Africa. It's also the eastern fence on the Kruger boundary. So this is Kruger National Park right next door here and then going into Sabi Gam Reserve to the east. The Greater Labombo Conservancy is an initiative started by the private landowners within this area adjoining Kruger National Park. As you can see the fence is in a bit of a state of disrepair which is to our benefit because it allows a free flow of game from Kruger into us and from us back, in, back into Kruger again. The idea of the Greater Labombo Conservancy is to expand a conservation area and adding a buffer zone towards the Kruger boundaries. This incorporates most of the area from the Masangira Dam right down to the Komati Port border post. Sabi Gampok cannot exist without the habitat. And, and looking after that habitat first and foremost allows us to then exponentially grow the rest of the, the wildlife. We have four major riverines that run through the park. You can see some of this behind us here with beautiful big fever trees in it, and big diosporus. Traditionally, in this area, the game used to move from the Sabi in the south and the Manzantonto River in the north. During the wet season, when all these other rivers had pools in them, the game could then spread out. In the dry season, those were the only two major water sources. So in the dry seasons, the game would migrate back either south or north to the two major rivers. So what we've tried to do is to establish water points so that the game can utilize the central part of the reserve even during winter. What we've got over here are man-made water holes. We've got five of them on this particular reserve. The reason we built these was during the drought, a lot of animals suffered from lack of water. So we provided five scattered water holes around the reserve and even during the dry season in a normal year when it's not a drought we can distribute the water evenly. Another important aspect is that we do not pump too much. It is crucial that we have a balance in the ecosystem. If we attract too many elephants or too many buffaloes in this area that could destroy the rest of the ecosystem around it. With my consulting ecologist, we're always monitoring the habitat utilization by game. One of our major problems here is elephant. We have a lot of elephant coming in through Kruger. They are hammering a lot of my big trees. And that is one area of concern, especially during the dry season when there's not much nutrient levels in, in the grasses. The elephants start hammering the trees. So we, we, we're monitoring that the whole time. With the provision of year-round water and by securing the habitat, wildlife numbers and diversity flourished. Through hunting and through sustainable utilisation and I stress ethical hunting, we've been able to take this place, Sabi Game Park, which is 30 odd thousand hectares, and turn it into a veritable paradise. When we began operating in this area, one of the first tasks that we took on was to engage with the community. The Sabi Game Park is committed to community upliftment projects with five major villages outside of the reserve. The local people here do suffer badly from a shortage of water, so we have drilled a number of these water points throughout the communities. We maintain these water points. The problem that we have in this area here is there's very little natural groundwater. So it's very difficult to find a good supply of fresh water. A lot of the water here is very brackish and almost unpalatable for human and livestock consumption. So quite a few holes were drilled that we did hit water but the water was unpalatable. So you have to close that hole down then move on and try and find a better source of water. There's about 15 in total in the communities around Sabi Game Park. A further community benefit is the provision of meat from the animals that are hunted in the reserve. What we've got here is the impala that we've just shot and we've brought it to one of our five communities that we look after. The way that we distribute it is not to give to the chiefs or the elders, but rather the kids that can take it home to each of their homestead. There's a group of kids that come in the morning, a group of kids that come in the afternoon. I'm the teacher of this school. I say thank you, the children and the school too. Thank you for the meat in Paris meat. Yes, thank you. In this afternoon, we teach grade three, four, and five. In the morning, we teach grade one, 
and grade two. The money from school came from Game Park. Game Park uh, built this school, these two classes, and there is a house there of the teachers too. It was made by Game Park. Now it's not just the schools that we've built, we've built clinics, we've built wells, uh, boreholes and dams for the cattle. When the Sabi Game Park was established, there were a number of families living within the boundaries of the reserve who needed to be relocated. An equitable resolution was agreed upon and the park undertook to build 15 new houses outside of the reserve for the displaced families. The people that get these houses is the people that they, they were inside of the fence and then they move them outside and then they build them, they give them these houses. There's a two bedroom, dining room and a veranda inside. Their whole lifestyle has been uplifted by the formation of Sabi. When we pay the government a license fee for an animal, 20% of that we work at getting back to the communities for their development. This goes into one account, which a tribal community will decide what to spend that money on. One of the suggestions that we put forward is putting up lion-proof bomas so the cattle can be penned at night in these lion-proof bomas to try and negate the lion-cattle conflict. We'll see how that goes. You know, it, it's got to be accepted by the community in general. Human-wildlife conflict is a fact of life in rural Africa. This fence over here is all that stops the wildlife and human conflict. So to our east, we've got all the communities that we look after. On a daily basis, we've got elephants or buffalo or lion trying to get out, trying to get into the arable lands, the crops and the lions trying to get cattle. In this instance, the lions chased a whole herd of buffalo through the fence out into the communal areas. As a result, we've had to employ a full-time staff that look after these fences on a daily basis. We fix these fences, it's electrified 24-7. Lions pose endless problems for people and their livestock. The Sabi Game Park has introduced an innovative solution to counter this threat. We have collared two lions on the property so far, one lioness, one lion. With the collar that we have on specifically the female, because the male doesn't tend to go anywhere near the fence. With the female, we can monitor her movements and we have the technology to be able to put in a virtual fence. So if the satellite tracking collar is picked up crossing a, a specific line close to the fence, it can then send out alarm bells and let us know and we can react to that problem and chase her back in before she starts trying to dig out through the fence. And we do intend to collar more lions. We have our village police. Those guys are elected by the communities. We pay them in partnership with WWF and South African Wildlife College. They report any problems in the community, whether it's human wildlife conflict, sick cattle, whether it's, it's buffalo that have got out, whatever the case is, there's a channel that they can report through and that eventually gets back to me. So if they have a problem, we can go and try and help and sort it out. Food security is a fundamental component of any community-based natural resource management program. The Sabi Game Park is proactive in helping the local communities develop their farming skills. This coming cropping season, there will be an agronomist coming in to show them how to look after their crop properly, how to weed, how to use herbicides, how to use insecticides to increase the yield of, the, of their crop. Once you start to establish food security for, for these people, they then will have excess, which they can sell, which then generates an income. The Sabi Game Park has secured from the government a safari hunting quota outside of the reserve for the local communities. The wildlife has been given an economic value. The people now view these animals as their own and in the same light as their cattle. The incentive to develop game populations across the region has been enhanced. These people can now control and manage their own areas with their own wildlife. We've got a good working relationship with these communities and I feel that they appreciate our presence. I think that they would be quite upset if hunting was to stop in these areas. They would no longer receive these direct benefits. Game populations, including the vulnerable black and white rhino, increased rapidly with the rehabilitation of the conservancy. 
it's a an important fact that we are right next to the greatest population of rhino anywhere in Africa or anywhere in the world. These animals have no economic value towards us. I can't hunt them. There may be a little bit of revenue received from photographic operators, but that is not why we look after these animals. We look after these animals because they are on the brink of extinction. Us being in the coal face of the battle, we have a responsibility and we have to look after these animals, albeit they have no value towards us. This brings on all sorts of challenges for security and this is our greatest challenge at this stage, combating the poaching of rhinos in this area. We've got helicopters in the air every day, planes in the air every day, a huge staff component, dogs, many vehicles, every single day patrolling our perimeters. This comes to about $75,000 per month. During our first few years, hunting was the only revenue received that contributed towards anti-poaching. However, the cost of anti-poaching in this area, due to the demand for rhino horn, has gone out of hand. No one concession, irrespective if you're a hunting operator or a photographic operator, can afford to run the anti-poaching unit the way we do, just from this source of revenue. The outsourcing of complete anti-poaching solutions is an emerging trend in Africa. The practice allows the operations to concentrate on their core business and responsibilities. The Dyke Advisory Group, or DAG for short, is a company that provides a comprehensive turnkey anti-poaching service. DAG has teamed up with the Sabi Game Park in order to tackle the poaching threat across the region. Sabi Game Park is particularly important by virtue of its position. It's got over 40 kilometers of border with Kruger National Park. It is a particularly attractive piece of the Greater Labombo Conservancy and at the time that we came here, this park was a route through into Kruger to destroy the large and depleting population of rhino that existed there, mainly white rhino but some black rhino as well. I believe there are three elements to what we are trying to do. And the first one is political will as one of the legs to this African pot. Political will is going to be very nearly impossible to achieve because um, whilst you can get a lot of pontificating people saying that they're going to do something, not a hell of a lot happens as it leaves the, 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 the room. The political will must, must filter down into the courts, into the police, into the whole of the structure of the fabric of the country that you're operating in to make sure that this is what they want, to look after their own environment, which is, which is large. The next part that is a vital part to what we're trying to do is that the community has got to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. And then the third part is what I call shock action. Shock action at this time must take place in what I call fortress conservation. We decide the area that we're going to be looking after and we secure it. By securing it, we are giving time to the people outside to achieve a measure of success in dealing with the local population and coming to some arrangement where they can see that they are part of what we're trying to do. And at the same time, and concurrently, we are looking at governments understanding the need for political will to make this a success, to look after our environment. By having been given the opportunity by the landowner here to base ourselves here, we are acting as a filter for people that pass through us into Kruger and pass back from Kruger to here. We catch them and we deal with them. The recipe that we have here should really be repeated all the way up the border of Kruger. And, and it's a very simple strategy. Early detection, rapid reaction. Then from that can flow every individual tactics. Sean van Niekerk is the anti-poaching manager for DAG in Mozambique. We've got a very dynamic small group of managers that work well together and we all have different specialties. All of us have been living in the bush for most of our lives. I'm the fixed wing pilot for DAG advisory group. My role for the anti-poaching operation is to locate the rhino from the air.
So I've got two hours a day to find those rhino. I normally split it into two flights, one in the morning, one in the evening. This type of flying, uh, it's generally quite low to the ground. I operate at about 200 to 500 feet AGL at all times. I'm uh, doing a lot of steep turns as well when I'm doing grid flying. So the dangers faced here is just uh, you really got to keep an eye on your speed and your power, especially because your head is outside of the cockpit at most times looking for rhino. And obviously at this height, there's a lot of bird activity as well. So I've constantly got to look out for birds and eagles or vultures and stuff like that. So once I locate the rhino, I normally save a GPS location. And once I land, I then give that location to Zero Alpha. The Bathawk found this rhino this evening. We've come up, we've had a look at it. Now we will deploy scouts onto this rhino and they will be on this rhino tonight and we'll get, then get uplifted tomorrow morning. And then we'll put another team on and we will continue to monitor this rhino while he's in the area. And we've got a special unit of guys which we will place on our rhino to watch them throughout the day. No one knows which rhino we're going to be watching, where we're going to be watching rhino. It's only that group of specialized members plus ourselves that are managing the ops. The reason why we don't let everybody on our rhino is like with any, any poaching team, it's information leakage is probably one of your biggest weaknesses. Aerial surveillance of the rhino population is expensive and the Sabi Game Park management team is always looking for new ways to cut operational costs. We have employed a Portuguese couple who are both veterinarians. Drow is a very experienced wildlife vet and has a lot of experience on rhino, elephant darting. With Zhao, our plan is any rhinos that come onto Swabi Game Park, we will dart, we will collar, we will put two collars on them, one a VHF collar and one a satellite collar, and they will be bracelet collars, they will go around the feet, we will ear notch, so that we can monitor the movement of the rhino. And that will be of great benefit to us and also to the, to the anti-poaching unit, because you will have eyes in the sky on these rhino 24-7, which means we don't, the, the utilization of the bat hawk and of the helicopter to find rhinos will be greatly reduced because we know exactly where those rhino are all the time. In addition to monitoring the rhino population in the reserve, DAG is committed to fighting the rhino perching scourge affecting the sub-region. Their strategy is based on early detection, rapid reaction. The Sabi Game Park's geometric shape is long but narrow. This means that there is little time to engage any poachers crossing the reserve en route to the Kruger National Park. So our whole strategy is around picking up the tracks as early as possible from after they've entered and then reacting to it as fast as we can. We've got Mozambique scouts and they're about 18 scouts. Plus, we also have government officials. So we work with two Mozambique government uh, forces. You've got the Guara Frontier, which we have six in the field, and you have the Fauna Bravia, which we have three. We've placed them all along our boundary line. So every one of these little yellow dots where we have scouts in the field. And all their job is to do every morning at first light, they're busy waiting, and as soon as it's light enough to see, they start walking our boundaries to pick up any detection of poachers. At the same time that the guys are, are walking the fence, we also have vehicles that are starting on each side of the reserve and driving the fence. Okay, Roger, let's um, just get, get north and then come down that Manga Line Road as well, check that area, and if nothing's seen, we'll... So you've actually got four fence checks a day. We've got the vehicles moving, plus we have the guys on the ground walking on foot. Now we do this on the boundary because there's a fence, there's an electric fence that's been put up by the reserve. Although the fence is not going to stop a human, what it does is it forces a human to show that he's crossed the fence. It's going to show tracks, it's going to show interference in this area. As soon as you pick up tracks, uh, you estimate the time, um, what they are doing, where they are going. It looks like three people. One track there, one track here, and then walk on that way. Right, left the pliers here. Start time on the here was the axis. He says around about four, three, four o'clock this morning. I've got two guys that's going to start tracking now, and then um, they will. Uh, you guys can assist them. I'm going to go to the front now. As soon as we pick up an entry, we immediately notify Kruger so they can start deploying their men. And 
we start the follow-up. So we, we put our dog as quick as possible. We get him there with the chopper and our, all of our good trackers. I carry always five liters of water each and every time I go out. Uh, three liters of, for the dog and two liters for me. A 10 meter puppy line so that the dog can get a free run in front of me. Now she knows that uh, I'm prepared. She knows we are going to do something now. We are going to run. We will normally suppress the area ahead of the tracking team. So the dog is running because the tracks are fresh. We want to see where this guy is right now. You know, our only job is to follow the dog uh, to the person who walked the track and uh, find him. So we'll have other trackers and other vehicles ahead of the tracking team checking out areas where we believe we'll pick up the tracks. We just got to finish checking the fence line, our fence line, opposite that area in case the poachers are already out so we know where to start looking. Either east, outside the reserve, or the poachers are still inside the reserve, up in the mountains, probably having a rest before they come out. Uh, so we've got the tracks coming in, we're going to leapfrog ahead, and if nothing found, then we'll move into the mountains. If we find the tracks ahead of the current tracking team, the guys who find the tracks start tracking and the chopper goes back, fetches the guys that are behind them and leaves for over there. I think we need more support. We need more support because the guys they went east, then they turned again. They are going now snare west. I'm the helicopter pilot for, uh, for DAG and my job as the, the pilot is just to deploy the tracking team with the K9 units and try and get onto tracks as soon as possible to see if we have a chance of catching up to the poachers. The secondary reason for having the helicopter here, aside from responding with a quick response force, is just to have the presence because I find that just being here and the, uh, the poachers knowing that there is a helicopter that uh, will pursue them, it brings down the number of entries. I take issue with the people that say We've got to be aware that poachers poach because it's a living. Bullshit. They don't give anything to the local population. That poacher threatens the local population in that he will say to a man, you will help me, otherwise tomorrow I'll break your wife's legs. Now that is an offer that he can't refuse, so he helps. I don't believe the stories that do go out about the poachers passing through the community being Robin Hood and dispensing largesse. Why should they? They're able, because they are thugs, bullies and criminals, they're able to threaten people, threaten their wives, threaten their fathers, threaten the old men. And I've lived my life in Africa and seen this happen. Today we started chasing the poachers since half past six in the morning and uh, caught the guys after 22 kilometers. When the aircraft started going up in the air, they obviously started running from where they were sleeping. That's 10 kilometers later, they went into thick bush. Two truckers in front hit contact. We had two squirters and uh, they got caught. And then the one was found hiding inside the bush, still with the weapon loaded. Luckily, they didn't fire at us. And that, that's generally your, your typical follow-up. You, you be, get a good direction of where the guys are going send the bats walk and the chopper ahead, suppress them, make sure they can't get picked up by a vehicle and that we just wait for the tracking team to catch up. These poachers are very clever. Since I've been here for two years now, I've never seen poachers walking like the one that we were chasing today. The death threats and the threats on our rangers' families is something to take into account when conducting these operations. For instance, Two of our rangers got quite badly beat up when they got caught in one of the villages after apprehending a poacher. This was a close life and death situation. It is a risky line of work, I could say. The reward for the poachers is, is so great. Number one, they're armed. Number two, they know if they get home, they make big bucks. You must remember, rhino horn is the most expensive illegal substance in the world. 
more than heroin, more than cocaine. The end consumer is paying 75,000 US dollars a kg. We've questioned poachers before and they would get 30,000 rand for a horn where the minimum wage in Mozambique is 1,000 rand. So you can see these guys are getting two to three to four, sometimes years salary with one horn. We did interrogate the guys and uh, we found out that the guys, they've hired the, the gun from someone else. They know who's their boss, who they are, when they entered, where they entered their tactics. They slept three nights in Kruger, one night in Sabi Game Park. We were chasing these troops for a long time now. I think it's now almost a year or a year and a half. Because we were trying to catch this guy, but we didn't, but today we did. What we have to do now is we have to wait for the police from Maputo to come in. They're going to come and collect the guys, take them to the nearest police station. To run an operation like this, you definitely need some very good funding. Funding is particularly difficult. All of our funding is all donor-based. Somebody sort of step up and say, right, there's money for a helicopter, there's money for a fixed wing. DAG's got a zero admin fee, and also DAG is a company that's doing a pro bono. So it's one of the few companies where everything comes straight onto the ground. If I don't get enough funding and we have to pull out, the poachers will come streaming through here, they'll go through and they'll kill in, in Kruger. Kruger have a, a great anti-poaching unit themselves, but it obviously helps them with us being here. We early detection for them. We actually catch quite a lot of groups before they even get to them. And that's what Savi Game Park and this anti-poaching unit has provided. By looking after the rhino, you're actually throwing a net over all species. There is no bushmeat poaching on the reserve at all. Nothing. Plus zero elephant poaching, which is obviously another big concern further north. The fact that we are active on the ground here the whole time makes it very difficult for people to come in and cut trees and brush to make proper snare lines. It's very difficult for them to do that undetected. Anybody that walks through this reserve or pick up, we pick up tracks or we're following a group of poachers, we treat them and we believe that they're rhino poachers. So, yeah, the risk is just not worth coming in for anything else. And also the fact that a large percentage of the animals that we take off the park the meat goes to the local community. If there was no hunting in this area, then there would, really there would be no, no reason for this place to exist. The communities wouldn't benefit at all from it. You know, one of the main reasons that they accept what we do here is because of, of the bonuses that they get from it. The cash injection into the communities, both with people employed by the reserve and also the levies that we charge people to come here that goes back into the communities. And once it's in the community bank account, they can use it as they see fit. If this place wasn't hunting, they would benefit from none of that at all. Then I think the poaching would become rampant because you do have protein hungry people outside the reserve. Even though they have reasonable herds of livestock, the livestock is seen as cash in the bank to them. It's not used as a source of protein. It's used as a, an indicator of wealth. They're not going to go and kill a cow or a goat to feed the family. They'd rather come and poach something which isn't going to cost them anything and has no meaning to them. The reserve would, would, would just dissolve. Then there definitely wouldn't be any rhino here. And there would just be a free flow of, of movement going into Kruger. The Sabi Game Park, a hunting reserve, is home to the only resident population of rhino in Mozambique. Its success has been made possible through controlled, sustainable safari hunting. The recent uplisting of lion by US Fish and Wildlife and the ban on ivory to America and many other countries has put us in quite a tough position whereby we no longer can market our product and generate the same amount of money as we once did to conduct these operations. Without the revenue from safari hunting, the reserve would simply not survive. Across the continent of Africa, repressive foreign laws and controls are stifling the conservation efforts of custodial organizations such as the Sabi Game Reserve. Yeah.